This is John Reese of Ubico, but really he goes without any introduction at all because it's John. John, <laughs> take it away. The only John. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, my talk is open policy agent can do that. The many use cases of OPA will, where we're going to kind of explore the more interesting use cases of, of OPA. Um, so uh, as introduced, yes, my name is John Reese. I'm a software engineer at, at Ubico. Uh, I'm also a member of the Open Policy Agent Organization, uh, focusing on a tool called CompTest, which actually does let you write a lot of policies against structured data, which we'll definitely get into later on in the, uh, in the talk. So first and foremost, definitely wanted to talk, uh, touch on like why are we talking about this? Um, and for me, it's because like the open policy agent can be used for more than just security. I've, I've seen a lot of like literature and a lot of talks in the ecosystem. Generally, when the topic of OPA comes up, it's generally around security. It's um, protecting microservices. It's it's authorization concerns. Um, but the o but OPA can be used for so much more than that. And I definitely wanted to touch on those aspects because even for me on a personal level, uh, I really got into OPA that had nothing to do with security. It was actually this talk uh, by Gareth who uh, wrote CompTest. Um, and this talk alone just like blew my mind for what OPA can actually do. Um, it's, it's a, <laughs> he, ex he showcased it such that it was a way that you can like unit test your Kubernetes manifest. Because what was really painful for me at the time was the slow feedback loop, right? You have to deploy to a cluster and then Kubernetes will tell you like that wasn't right or you have to try to deploy something else to a cluster. It's like you're missing this file. Whereas with policies um, and his tool, you can actually do all those verifications without needing to touch a cluster. So it really sped up that, that feedback loop for me. And also, so I want to also definitely touch on like what is policy because again, I, I get the, the vibe that policy comes with security, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So I just stole this from the Merriman Webster dictionary and it's just, it's a, it's a contract where we can make an assurance. And so security or not, we can say like, Hey, all Docker files have to be derived from some, from, from some base image. Like maybe your team, maybe your company says it is our policy that all Docker files must have like this as a base image. We can say if you check in the git ignore to your repository that um, it must include the node modules folder because we don't want to check that bad boy in. Uh, Kubernetes resources must include an owner label so that we can apply like cost analysis to it or just know who to contact in the event of some of some failure. And at this point, right, there's there's kind of two ways that we can enforce these policies. If you're kind of a newer shop or maybe like you're not in this space quite yet, you typically see these as readmes or, or Word documents, right? It's the, it's the company policy or, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Otherwise, it's going to be with peer knowledge and review. You have to be in the know of what you can and cannot do. And these are all sort of make manual checks within our pull request. And just because you write a little document, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's enforced. So we want to get to a space where it's actually automated. And OPA is something that can actually do that for us. So obviously we have to talk about what open policy agent actually is, especially if you're not familiar with it. Um, taken from the, uh, the website, it's a general, open, it's a general purpose uh, policy engine that you can unify policy enforcement across the stack. Um, I typically just boil this down to like, it's, it's a yes, no engine. It's a way for you to ask it a question and then it'll tell you yes or no, whatever that, that, that question may be. So for example, if we were to have, have some state in the world, we'll just say like a person, and this person is age 30 and they're located in, in the US, and we wanted to ask like OPA, is this person able to, to, to drink? Um, OPA is gonna know about all the policies that you have defined for it, and so in this case, the policy is going to pass because the location is equal to USA and, they're, and they are greater than 21 because they are 30. So the policy is going to pass. In order for it to actually fail, every single line would have to be true in this case. Also, OPA has two modes of, of operating. Again, I think a lot of the time we think of it as an external service or some sort of sidecar. 
Um, in the external service type of, of ecosystem, it's, a, it's generally deployed as a workload, especially into clusters, and then all of your services are going to make requests to that centralized service, which has pros and cons. Um, you know, it gives you that, that one place to do your, your authorization, um, and then no matter what language that your services are, are written in, they can make requests to it, because ultimately it's just going to be a JSON-based request but you have to have this knowledge and expertise to run this service. The other way that we can do this, and probably the most powerful to me, and what a lot of these tools are gonna to be built off of, is the fact that OPA can actually be run as a library. So all of the, the, the smarts of OPA, you can import into your own projects and get that functionality in your applications. And so this makes it really easy to begin using OPA and you don't need an external service. If you live in this, you know, in this environment where all of your backend services are written in Go, then you can actually just write all your policies in your applications without even needing to deploy OPA. You can just purely use the library functionality of it. And so one of the big things to, uh, to consider is that OPA is going to expect all of its input to be JSON. Which has, which has pros and cons, but the, the biggest thing is that we can then pretty much represent anything as JSON, and so that gives us the ability to write policies for a lot of things that you might not think of. So one of the really, really cool things that I've actually seen in practice is this idea of writing policies for your repository. So consider like we have this, we have this repository where we have a list of services, um, service A and service B, and there's a readme inside of that. Now, one approach that we can use to kind of represent this as JSON is actually to just use the, the tree command and then output that as JSON. Um, the JSON format itself is not super important. Uh, you can use whatever format you want, proprietary or just use this. OPA doesn't really care just as long as it's, it's, it's in JSON and your policies are written to kind of know this, this format. And so now that it's in JSON, uh, we can actually say, we can actually, let's say, okay, well, let's have a policy that says, like, all service directories must start with the word service. And this is what that rego would, would look like. If the input type is directory, the root directory um, does not start with the name service, then we can say that that's an invalid service. And this can be really powerful in things like large monorepositories mono where like your CI depends on very explicit folder structure. So like all services must have a Docker file in the root is a, is a big one. All services must have a readme or however you want to, um, or whatever policy you want to write for that. Whereas before without this, you'd have to do manual checks for that. Uh, continuing on is like another example. We can have like a, a configuration file. This one is just defining a, a web app. We're saying that the application is currently running in a production mode and the server protocol is HTTP. So like anything, we have to take that configuration file and convert it into, into a JSON format. And then once again, we can write policies for that. So no matter what uh, type of structured data that you want to write policies for. Again, move it into JSON, and then you can write policies for it. In this case, the policy is going to fail. This, this won't be allowed to be checked in or deployed into the repository because the protocol is set to HTTP, and so we hit all of the, all the uh, regular lines there. And so like, that probably seems like a lot of work in terms of you have to know how to convert that data to, to JSON. Um, you might end up like you know, a lot of teams representing the same I and I in different ways or, um, or a lot of things like that, but there is a solution and that's actually a comp test. Um, this is a tool that ha contains a lot of different parsers inside of it. Um, that will actually take an input such as like an INI file, Docker files, Q files, Terraform, et cetera. There's a large, large list of parsers that are currently supported. It'll take that as input and then do all the, do the JSON bits for you. So if we were to take another example, um, kind of Kubernetes focus where we want to ensure that our deployment manifests meet a couple 
a uh, couple of constraints in that like they can't run as root and they have to provide some sort of pod selectors. On the right hand side is the, the YAML file for this, the YAML definition. And there's and at the moment those are not there. But if we run this through comp test, we can see we, we pass in the, the policy for it and then the deploy.yaml and comp test will again internally turn that into JSON and verify that for you. So without even needing to deploy to your cluster, you can just run this like on a local environment in a CI environment, and you can ensure that your workloads are passing or failing again without even needing a cluster. The also really, really cool thing um, that I don't see a lot of and would love to get more into is actually the ability to combine multiple inputs. And so like the idea here is that everything we've been talking about is really about single inputs. There was like the single web application, there's a single deployment, but uh, Comtest also has the ability to combine multiple inputs, which gives you a bigger state of the world. So for example, let's say we were to um, uh, change some immutable fields on a deployment. If you were to deploy a deployment to a cluster, assuming it's valid, it's just going to work because that's the first of its kind. But if you were to change that same deployment and maybe update some label selectors or touch an immutable field, you're not going to know about that until you actually deploy it to a cluster. But with uh, CompTest and combining the inputs, you can take your current deployment, the desired deployment, and then compare the two and see if the, there's a change in one of those immutable fields. There's also things like if you're using like Prometheus service monitors, are you deploying a service monitor that doesn't select on a service? This is actually valid, but when you go to like your alert manager configuration, it'll just say down and you, don't, you won't know why. Um, the other one that I've run into a few times is if you have like a deployment workload that defines a service account, but the service account doesn't exist. Again, you'll try to, to uh, deploy it, but you won't know that it fails until you actually try to deploy it. So what that'll look like is, you know, we have our deployment on the right. We are saying that there's a service account name of foo. There is no service account here, definition named foo. And so that this policy will, will fail because it's going to look at that service account name and then look at all of the YAMLs that, that you give it. So right now I'm giving it deploy.yaml and namespace.yaml, and it will search for a, a kind of a service account within that same namespace that matches that account. So this will, again, this will let you know, hey, you're trying to deploy something that's just going to, to fail. Again, all on local machines or CI. Uh, definitely had to touch on Gatekeeper a bit. Um, there's a lot of literature out there, so I don't want to dive too much into it, but the, the core idea of, of Gatekeeper is to enforce these sorts of policies in a more production environment and ensure they're actually um, not on your cluster. So the idea is that Comtest is really about shifting your policy concerns to the left, um, running policy checks on local, on CI, and then you use Gatekeeper to, to verify that they aren't actually in your cluster. And then again, using those, those same policies across the stack. Uh, the other really cool thing that we can do is there's a, um, there's a tool called Constraint that actually makes the management of gatekeeper policies a lot easier to, to work with. Um, and it, but it also includes like documentation for your policies and more control over your policies. So it's better to just kind of showcase an example. So one of the things that, um, that we can actually do is start including some comments into our, our policy files which gives us the ability to define, say, like a title for, for the policy and then a more apt description of what the policy is doing. So that way, if you have, like, if you are like a platform engineering team and your team is, um, or your company you know, is exposing a Kubernetes cluster for people to use, um, so they don't have to know Rego, they can just kind of look at this and see what the policy is doing and why it exists and which Kubernetes resources that it's enforced on. And on the same vein, you can set at what enforcement level is this? Is it a deny? Is it an audit? Is it a warn? And that way for your dev environments, you can start auditing things and progress that all the way throughout to production.
And so one of the examples of that, this is a, a markdown document of one of the, um, of one of the, the policies that, that were generated. You can see what the severity was, the resources that it impacts, the description, optionally the rego if you want it, and then where that policy lives, which again makes it a lot more digestible for end users of your system. The, the other thing that we can do with, with the OPA, kind of drastically shifting gears here, is actually using policy to check your infrastructure um, that, that's deployed in, in the cloud. So one of the things that kind of often comes up is this idea of like infrastructure compliance. We have to make sure that all of our infrastructure is deployed and running in a way that's compliant. Um, there's like Sys Azure, AWS, Google, there's some NIST, there's some SOC 2. And OPA can actually look at our cloud infrastructure and, and verify against you know, a set of rego rules that these are all compliant. So to kind of take an example, um, this is just a, a random requirement from Sys Azure. It's just saying that uh, storage accounts have to have the security transfer enabled, meaning HTTPS has to be on. So if we were to define one of our storage accounts in, in Terraform, we can say um, what the name is, location, account here. The important bit is the enabled HTTPS traffic only. That has to be set to true. We can have our Rego rule that says that like that has to be set to true. Um, so in this case, if it's false, then we can respond back saying that you have to have secure transfer required. Um, the other thing that we can do, if you, at least if you're familiar with Terraform, there's the plan operation, which you can also look at, uh, look at as JSON and you can run that whole plan through OPA as well, because again, it's, it's JSON. And the last thing I wanted to touch on is actually something that's like really, really cool that I am hoping to see more, uh, more usage out of, is actually the, the thought of kind of bringing it to the front end. Um, so typically when we think of, of OPA and like policy, we're generally, at least for me, thinking about it and how we're protecting like API calls. If you're making like a, a curl request or something, you're hitting, you're trying to like create users or you're trying to perform some action and we need to make sure that we're actually protecting that. However, uh, the front end is going to have the same concerns, you, especially in like the visibility department. If you're wanting to say, create a user, maybe we shouldn't even be exposing that create user button, or maybe it should be grayed out. And so at least in my experience, I've seen just a lot of the, the sort of same policies kind of duplicated in the front end, but not using your Rego, not using your OPA, the actual source of truth. Um, and so one of the things that we can kind of experiment with is like we can write like a, a component that says, okay, well, they're trying, this button will, ultimately make a post to the user's endpoint, which is creating a user. And so if they can do that, then render the add user button. And so when the page loads, it can make a web request to, to OPA, uh, evaluate that policy, like, can this user do that? Because typically you'll have some like subject of who is doing it. If their role is an administrator in this case, then they can allow the uh, the request to go through and again ultimately render that for us. So this gives us the ability to protect our APIs and then also render front ends based on policy. So if we change the policy in one place, then not then that also will update our front ends automatically. That alone can be its own talk and honestly it is. Um, this is the only one I've really found on the on the subject. But again, much like Gareth's talk, this is something that kind of like blew my mind of like, oh yeah, I didn't think about doing OPA and sort of like front end checks. So I highly encourage you to, to look at this as well. Uh, so in closing, um, I mean, policy for me, you know, is more than just security. It can, it can be uh, used in a lot of other contexts. So does your project meet some sort of standard? Like are there Kubernetes configurations that you may have missed? And then Ultimately, you can even get into like business rules engine, which I've seen a couple of times in the past as well, where like, let's say you want to, like you have an address and there's a bunch of metadata for that. Like there's like the weight of the package, the delivery date. You can say, you can apply all that to like different sets of couriers and like say who can fulfill this request. 
so you can use it as a way to find, find the answers for your end users. Then over here, I have a link to all my resources, but that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, so I mean, I guess the, it would be definitely one of those things where I guess I would want to weigh just the, the complexity of it is, is probably going to be my, my go-to answer for that, right? You, Rego is a little complicated in, in my opinion. Um, it does, you know, take some expertise to run. So you could probably, you know, in much simpler systems, you probably could get away with a very, very simple like RBAC check. So I guess if you have a very simple and straightforward permission structure, then OPA would probably be overkill in that case. Um, but yeah, if you, have a, if you have like lots of policies and like lots of complication there, it, it could be a good fit. Don't be shy. No, if we had the Slack going on or something like that on the on the live stream, we would get all the other oh. questions too from around the world. <laughs> um, listen, we're going once, twice, three times. John, thank you a ton. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, let's see, 441 in uh, Detroit. And we go here and we look at our fantastic little scheduler. Um, so we're a little early in this room, which is great because people are getting tired and we got one starting promptly at five Detroit time, top of the hour, wherever you are. And, um, we'll see you there and at the main room. And then after that, uh, a little later on, we're going to finish up with the lightning rounds, which I'm looking forward to. So we'll see you in a bit. <laughs>